My name is Bob Block. I'm the director of BYO Biz, and I'm also uh, an instructor in one of the sections of Business 120. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, we have a few uh, distinguished guests with us today. We have, of course, Professor Jay McKee right here. So, uh, um, so Jay, we're glad he's with us. And then we have a, a, a couple of entrepreneurs uh, that we've invited. That they're uh, here with us. One is uh, Jason Leventhal, who is the founder of Wine Skis, and also more recently Jay Skis. And uh, why don't you just stand up and take a bow? And, uh, uh, Students in my section uh, know Jason because he is our client for the marketing <coughs> plan uh, project this semester, and we thank you for that. And also, I want to mention um, Jason will be uh, the Stiller School of Business and BYO Biz entrepreneur in residence uh, in the fall semester. So he'll be around. Uh, to work with anybody on uh, any projects or uh, just to give advice on a uh, wide range of topics with he, which, with which he is equipped to do that. Also have two other guests, uh, uh, two other entrepreneurs, uh, Matt McGinnis, a uh, recent graduate of Champlain, and his partner Jake Kijiji, who is currently a senior, right? Um, and they have an interesting company called Hemetic, which makes uh, high quality uh, backpacks and other related uh, gear and uh, all made in America. So uh, welcome uh, and great to have you here. So now I want to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Jeremy Kent. Um, and uh, I'll let him tell a little bit about uh, himself and how he got to be where he is today. But uh, let me just say, um, uh, Jeremy uh, started as at UVM as an English and anthropology major. Right. So he goes to sh uh, to prove that you can be an in English and anthropology major and have a successful business career. Uh, if any of you are thinking of switching your majors, uh, but anyway, um, I got to know Jeremy uh, on a board we serve on, and he uh, <coughs> is one of the uh, young stars at Burton. He's currently global business director for their year-round products, which I guess means anything that isn't snowboards. Kind of. I'll get in all of it. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, let's have a warm welcome for Jeremy Kent. What's up, guys? Did everybody hear me? Okay. Um, before I begin, uh, I just want to say to Jason. So I've been in Burlington. I went, you know, went to UVM. Kind of came and went a little bit, but I remember years ago when Lion Skis first started, and everybody was just so stoked that there was a Vermont-born brand. You know, I was born a skier, and eventually kind of made the switch over and sort of celebrate both. So, definitely like tip of the hat to him for sort of leading new business stuff here, and to the young guys. Um, you know, ten years ago I started at Burton, and my first job there was uh, assistant product manager for backpacks, and so like. To this day, I've worked on a lot of different products at Burton, but for sure, backpacks are definitely like still sort of near and dear to my heart. It's kind of my favorite, so I'll be psyched to talk to you guys kind of after. Um, all right, so super simple. I'm going to try to cover some ground today. It sounds like we've got some business students, we've got some marketing students, so I tried to take a little bit of a hybrid approach. Um, really basic. Bob asked me to just give you a little bit of my background for sort of how I got to where I am. I know that when I was in college trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life, it was sort of you know, different paths. If you weren't going to be a doctor or lawyer, you just kind of had to either jump into the job you wanted or sort of connect the dots to kind of get there. So I just want to start there so you guys kind of know who I am. And then really I want to share maybe six or seven things about um, my experience at Burton that I think are notable. I sort of asked myself, like, if I were sitting in your seat and I had to come listen to some other dude lecture for 45 minutes, like, what's the biggest contribution I could make to you guys that's sort of no BS, all killer, no filler, as we like to say at Burton sometimes, like stuff that you actually might find interesting when you kind of get into that world yourself or if you're already starting a business. So anyways, uh, just to set the record straight, this is me at 19 at about your age, um, just up the street at Burton, or excuse me, at UVM. Um, I transferred into UVM, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I was born in Vermont. My mom worked there, so the price was right. It was pretty cheap. Um, I had uh, long hair and a skateboard and didn't really know what I was doing myself and took a couple business classes at UVM. Bear in mind, this is, this is a time when uh, I was just thinking the other day about how old I am and uh, 
I was telling a buddy of mine that um, I remember being in a computer lab at UVM, and he was like, have you heard of this, this thing, uh, this email? And I'm like, well, what's email? And he's like, yeah, you can write to people. Like, just, you don't have to write letters anymore to your high school friends. And I'm just like, no, it's just a fad. Like, don't bother with it. And so dating myself for how long ago it was. But I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I was uh, in college. And I took a business class or two. And they were sort of like how to get a job at IBM. And it was just obviously not me back then. So for lack of a better major, I took some anthropology classes. My aunt, I remember at one of my sister's weddings, she said, you know, I just thought you'd be in, in anthropology and all I could picture was sort of Indiana Jones like swinging through the jungle. And I'm like, yeah, anthropology, that sounds pretty badass. And so I took, you know, got into anthropology and, um, and then towards the end of it, and I was like, well, actually, it's just a lot of library work unless I want to live in Papua New Guinea and that wasn't really what I was looking for. So I added English as a second major. I figured if nothing else, I could carry on an interesting kind of conversation. So um, this is sort of what like, life looked like for me, just in terms of connecting the dots to my, my gig at Burton today, which I'll talk to you about in a second. Started at UVM, took the bonus five years to get there, in part because I realized I needed a double major. I had to sort of rub two liberal arts majors together to get a real job after I sort of left um, the college nest. And while I was at UVM, I actually worked at the boathouse, the Burlington Community Boathouse, BCBH, as we called it back then. It was a marina. It's actually where I first learned about the Sailing Center, which is the board that um, Bob and I <coughs> work on together. Um, you know, standard dock master, pounding nails on docks, taking care of guests or whatever. And then I gained a little responsibility as a harbor master. And to this day, I think back on my old boss there um, and just I think what he instilled in me a little bit of just general project management, and I would, you know, sound simple, but don't underestimate that the summer job you have now or that you had in high school, some of the basic skills you have there, I swear to you, someday you're gonna, if you have good bosses and you find things that you're interested in doing, you're gonna be down the road and realize that like it's the stuff that actually still pays off. There's no sort of magic behind it. People who just get shit done in, behind the, in the four walls of Burton are people that have been doing that for 20 years since, since college. So. Anyways, I started there, graduated, didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. I did know that I loved to snowboard, and um, that's all that really mattered at the time. So I moved down to southern Vermont, spent a lot of time in Killington, was teaching snowboarding and skiing, actually, because I grew up skiing, bartending a bunch, and uh, life was pretty fun. And I uh, didn't have to worry too much about the real world. All my paychecks came in cash, so um, life was pretty easy. And at some point, I realized, okay, you know, now in my early, mid-20s, and I should figure out something that might make me a living. I saw a lot of 40-year-old bartenders up in Killington, and none of them looked quite as psyched as the 22-year-old bartenders. So kind of pieced two and two together, and I said, all right, I should figure something out. So I started to do a little bit of freelance writing. Um, it started with the little local weekly <coughs> down there called The Mountain Times. I think it's still in business. And um, then a couple of the things I did for, like, the Free Press and I think the Rutland Herald, like, my favorite swimming holes, just all stuff that I was interested in. Um, and did some music reviews for seven days and did some, um, some interviews. We, I remember interviewed um, John Mayer the first time he came here and then Michael Franti, the guy from Spearhead. And it was just like a kind of fun thing and it impressed my mom because I was actually using my English major and it, and it gave me enough discipline at the time to not just snowboard, go to the bar, repeat, you know, I actually had some sort of grown up <laughs> deadlines I had to hit and it was nice to get a little sort of extra paycheck. And it's funny, looking back, for me, I, ha I really honestly had no idea, like the writing, I, w I didn't want to be a writer, I knew that, I was, a, I was mediocre at best, but I f it was like an interesting way to organize my thoughts and it was, unless I was going to move to Papua New Guinea, it was kind of like the gig that I could sort of convince people I was qualified for with my degree. Um, but I didn't really think about it as a way to, to get to Burton Snowboards. It had nothing to do with that at all. It was just sort of like, I was honestly winging it. Psyched to have a degree. It's exciting to be able to go and write a story about dropping into the half pipe for the first time or whatever, sailing on the lake or something that was, I was into, but that was kind of it. So then from there, I decided to move back to Burlington. I was into it. There was a little startup called Fuse um, Sports Marketing, which is still in town in Romanewski now. A buddy of mine who's a contemporary of, like, in my class at UVM, I knew him through doing some event stuff or whatever together. He and a couple other people had started this company, and it was, um, Jason can attest to this, like, action sports and sort of outdoor winter stuff was kind of booming um, in Burlington. There was sort of a scene kind of happening, and, and Fuse was there at the right time to pick up some good clients. They worked with Burton a lot, and then they expanded into lots of other outdoor brands. And uh, they needed a PR manager somebody that basically would write press releases and 
believe it or not at the time, fax them out to different news stations about a surf contest, a snowboard contest, a new product launch or whatever. And they, they had a three month project, um, nothing more, said no benefits, we'll just pay you, you come in for three months, just a hired gun. And I said, sounds awesome, you know? And so I actually kept the bartending job, eventually negotiated only work four days a week because I was making more money in the bar in Killington every, on the weekends than I was working the grown up day job at Fuse. Um, but I did that for a few years and um, I learned a ton, but I was still writing. Um, I didn't necessarily think that I was the best marketer in the world in terms of just straight up marketing execution, but I was able to kind of get connected to lots of different kinds of brands. So it gave me exposure to how Quicksilver works versus Burton, how you know Pepsi works versus um, you know an outdoor brand or whatever. And so this one day we drove to um, New Hampshire, which is the headquarters for EMSs, Eastern Mountain Sports, big retailer kind of here on the East Coast. We we're doing this new lookbook, um, this full kind of product launch for them. They were trying to do a rebrand. They, they realized that their customers are all getting older and they needed to try to find a way to engage and, you know, engage with some younger customers. And more kids were snowboarding, skateboarding, and not rock climbing, and their image was kind of dated. So we went there and we did this full deep dive with them. And I met this guy named Ted Manning, and he, uh, he was the product manager for sleeping bags, tents, and backpacks. And I'm sitting here taking notes, and he's pulling out these big technical, you know, overnight packs and all this stuff. And I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, like, this guy has the dream job. Like, what am I doing wasting my time writing press releases about events that I can't go to in Fiji that look interesting, but I'm never going to get there. So I left that meeting kind of obsessed with the idea that I wanted to work in product. And really, I don't think Jason was going to hire me at Lions, so there was only, the only other game in town I knew was, uh, was at Burton. And so this is where I learned one of those, it's not just what you know, it's who you know. It's like having a couple friends that worked at Burton at least gave me an opportunity to talk to the guy who'd be the hiring manager for the job I really wanted, but I wasn't qualified for it all. So short version, I apply for a job. Uh, I think I originally applied for a job and never got a call back. Applied for a second job in product, entry level. Tried to convince them, hey, I've worked with product people, just writing press releases and doing media stuff. Maybe I can do the product <coughs> stuff. Kind of, a, kind of a leap, right? They brought me in. We had this great interview. Uh, met all these people, felt, feeling great about it. And I left. And uh, they came back. And they called me. And they said, you know, we like you, but we hired this guy from within. I'm like, that sucks. So I don't know. A month goes by. I'm kind of more despondent. The PR thing's kind of grinding on me. I'm just not great at it. Another job comes up actually this time for a backpacks gig. So I do it again, I know the guy is hiring, I'm feeling really good, I've networked my way in. Another interview, I talk to more people, I'm talking to VPs and corner offices and I'm feeling like the man. And uh, <clears throat> they call me and they say, sorry, but the last guy only lasted three months, we got, we're in a jam, we gotta really find somebody to experience, like you're not it. So I was like, I'm, that's it, I kinda missed my window. So there's not a lot of other jobs out there in product. So bummed about it. And then a few weeks later, I remember I was, you know, whatever, going to the supermarket, talking to my high school buddy, like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. It just seems like the Burton thing's not going to happen. I love Burlington, but I don't really know what my other possibilities are. So then I got this call from HR at Burton, and they said, well, we can't find anybody good, so if you can get on a plane to Asia in 14 days, you can have the job. And that was it. Hung up the phone, and the rest was history. So kind of got in at the ground floor at Burton. Started working in backpacks, literally first day on the job, three weeks in China. So funny too because the, I went with my boss at the time, who's not a Burton any longer, and uh, I had to get a visa and it came like midnight the night before my flight. I was at the airport at 5 a.m. I'm just terrified I'm flying to Hong Kong, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm just questioning like, can I really do this job? I convinced them that like, I, could, I could do it, but I don't really know what's going on. They're flying me to Asia. And uh, we get there, we get to the airport, and. He hands me a ticket and we, you know, we fly to Chicago or whatever's connecting and then we're getting on the plane and, and he's like, yeah, follow me. We go to the second floor of this plane and we're sitting in first class and I'm like, I am the man. I have made it. I'm in first class, <laughs> flying to Asia. All the haters that said it would never happen. I got a job at Burton. I got it all figured out. Unfortunately, that was 10 years ago and it was the last first class flight I ever took on Burton. So. <laughs> Anyways, so that's a little bit about kind of where I'm at. If you guys have fur further questions, I basically worked in product for a while, did every job I could learned from the ground up development, a little bit about design, a little bit about general merchandising, product management. Now I kind of, I'd say, my official title is that I'm a business director, but you really just do a little bit of everything. It's, we don't, we're a pretty flat organization. It's not like I get to just kick back and relax and boss people around. I'm doing everything that I used to do on day one, 
and that's one thing I'll tell you guys is if you, you know where you want to be and what you want to do, if you get in, it can be really easy to just want to grow and to go up in an organization because you can make more money, you got more responsibility, you can get people working for you. But ultimately, if that is what you want to do, those first days that you were in that business are the ones that matter the most. Because if you learn those fundamentals right, there's people at Burton, to be totally honest, off the record, that are great at what they do, and there's some people that suck at what they do. And the people that suck at what they do, they just hustle to try to get up into titles, and they don't really know what they're doing up at those spaces. Versus the people I know I have the most respect for, they just came in every day and they just grinded it out. They asked questions, they worked hard, they went home, and they came back and they did it again. So if you guys know what you want to do, don't sweat kind of where the accolades are going to come. Just fall in love with that process and you'll, you'll sort of connect the dots down the road. All right, make sense? Okay, so let's talk, enough about me, let's talk about Burton. <clears throat> so I want to give you like six or seven things that I think are really important for what has made Burton successful. Obviously, <clears throat> big brand, I'm not going to tell you because they make the best snowboards like, or you know, whatever. We had a great marketing program. Things that maybe you wouldn't know from the outside that I think would be helpful if I were sitting in your seats. So the first thing is what sometimes in the business speak is called kind of, um, you know, the early mover advantage. It was 1977, snowboards had been invented, the snurfer was out there, people were trying it. Jake was not the first guy to make a snowboard, uh, and he, there were a lot of people that tried before him to commercialize it, but they did get in early. Jake and Donna, uh, Donna's his wife, they did get in early, and it gave him uh, you know, a ramp up time to sort of figure out the sport before lots and lots of other brands were out there trying to do it, before skiing had had this big renaissance. And so as you're thinking about sort of new businesses you want to get in, I do encourage you, you're not going to be the first guys to make backpacks, but ask yourself, like, can we be the first at something? Can we get into some open space that somebody hasn't really thought about that much? And one other thing I wanted to kind of show you here, let's see if I can pull this up, um, is uh, a little bit about demographics, too. It sounds funny, and this looks like a boring graph, but this is basically the age of people, men on the left, women on the right, in the U.S. in the last 100 years. So what's interesting is if you check it out, okay, it's back in 1900, whatever, Everybody knows population's growing. Let's get up to like around when Jake was born, you know, sort of in here. You can see there's this big sort of spike in population, a really young audience. And then when he starts the company, let's get along to like 77. You'll see, what do you guys see there? How, yeah. Well, how, do you, how do you read that graph? Sure. So, so here, I'll just come out here and show you. The age is going up pretty yeah. yeah, so this is the number of people in millions. This is their ages, this is men, this is women. So I certainly don't think that Jake and Donna kind of thought about this when they first started, but it's interesting is it's 1977, the business is about to begin, and you look at where we got this really big spike of ages, right around where you guys are. So you had a lot of young people that had like watched their parents and grandparents ski at these old resorts, it was sort of boring, and they were, you know, they were into new stuff. And for, for some of us that are a little bit older, they know sort of in the political history of and the pop culture history, a lot of the changes that were kind of happening in that era. So a lot of people were kind of ready for change. And I do really think that that's part of what um, gave, gave Burton an interesting advantage. And as, as you watch time go on, that age group kind of stayed with uh, the company for a while. And then when we get into the 80s and 90s, it doesn't have that big spike in that younger audience. But by then, the sport of snowboarding has sort of took off. Yeah. What's uh, the name of that uh, I can send you the links after, but yeah. this is just basically the U.S. Census. There's all kinds of graphics you can look at that tell you uh, gender, age, ethnicities, backgrounds, religion. You know, when every, the U.S. Census sends out a little thing every year, whatever it asks people to fill it out. Not everybody does, but it gives them sort of sense of how populations are shifting. Cool? Yeah, thanks. So step one, sounds easy, but be the first one to do it or be in early. Um, and, you know, find, find a unique a unique purpose in kind of doing that. So then the second thing I'd like to tell you is, as you guys think about, say you want to start a business, you guys are business partners. Um, I'm sure Jason can attest to this too. This is an old adage you hear from Jim Collins, sort of a famous um, you know, business cultural writer, is uh, sort of first two. You have an idea for what you want to do, but there's so much evidence that shows now that who you pick to be in business with or to work with on a daily basis is way more important than the product you pick. I know that snowboarding seems like it's the most important thing about Burton, but I can tell you right now that if Jake and Donna were two different people and they didn't surround themselves with the people they did at the time, I just don't know if it ever would have gotten off the ground. I want to show you just a real quick video that kind of is a testament to this. We'll see if this, I can pull this off. So this is 
hopefully this volume's not going to kill you. I don't know where it's at right now, but um, so this is a video from way back in the day when Jake was just getting started from a contest, you know, someplace out west. I'll skip a little bit of the boring stuff, um, and you'll just get a feel for kind of who he was, and it gives you a little bit of like the value he brought to the company from the beginning. It'll kick in here in a second. I'm uh, Jake Burton, carpenter of Burton Snowboards in Wondery, Vermont, and uh, just finished up a real good contest here at Ski Cooper, where I won't promote it. A real good contest. I think uh, I only came with one other guy, and we made a really good showing. We got a second and a fifth in the slalom. I'm not sure how we did in the uh, freestyle. I think we fared pretty well. How did you get into it? Well, uh, a company called uh, La Brunswick Corporation we used to make something called a snurfer a long time ago. I wrote those for like the last 10 years. Nobody really improved it, and looking back, he just sort of getting flustered with that particular board. He just decided to sort of make it something on my own. And I've been at it three years and had three probably worst winners snow-wise you can ask for, back east especially. And this year out west, we started getting things rolling out here. But I'm real happy with it personally, and I really think that we're doing good things for the sport back east, and a lot of people doing good things for the sport out here. Friends are right here. They're aluminum fins made out of aircraft alloy. They're real tough. We've ridden this board for most of the year, and you can see it's still in real good shape, totally rideable. Front foot goes in this binding right here, and then your back foot tucks underneath this back binding. So you've got enough leeway there. The back binding's different from the front binding, so that you can adjust your stance to suit your style or whatever type of ride you're doing, whether it's a deep powder or freestyle or whatever. Got a twin pin board with how awesome the best part is that he actually says totally radical which I find is so cool so a couple of things to point out obviously Jake iconic in our industry but what I hear what I heard in that narrative and you can hear it if you dig around a little bit more about him is starts the business three bad snow years in a row first of all starts it in Vermont which we we know and Jason can test to it's like we don't have the most predictable snow here in the world. We don't have the biggest mountains. So it wasn't the most obvious choice for a place to start what became the biggest and most successful snowboarding brand in history. But starts out with three bad years and he tells this great story you can find in some interviews about. He remembers going out on the road and um, you know he'd sold a few and he was trying to get the sport off the ground and packs 37 snowboards in his car, goes literally door to door knocking, trying to sell the snowboard comes home at the end of the day with 39 of them because two people want to return the ones that he had already sold. So this sort of, Jake had this real obsession in the beginning. He was so laser focused on making this whole thing work that I honestly think nine out of 10 people in his same shoes would have found a bunch of reasons to quit when he just basically said like, I'm leaving my entire life behind and I'm going to focus on making this work no matter what. Sort of, you know, the, the old colonists who talk about you'd land the boat on the beach and you'd burn the boat to the ground so that you had no choice but to succeed. I mean, Jake really, to this day, when you have meetings with him, he has that kind of intensity about him. And the second thing I wanted to point out is that this young lady right here is his wife, who was officially sort of a team writer way back in the day, and that's Donna Carpenter. She's the president of Burton, and she's a, um, an often untold story about the success of our company. Jake, um, if you hear that video, you know, very, very persistent, also kind of a natural marketer. He's telling you he's got aircraft alloy on this crazy old wooden board. Shows him flying through the woods, looking like he's gonna kill himself, and then tells you one minute that they're really safe and tells you the next minute that you can go as fast as you want. And I'm like, the guy was just sort of born to sell. So he brought a lot of that to, our, to the business. Don, on the other hand, very financially savvy, um, level-headed, you know, Jake, where Jake was a product tinkerer, she really cared about the company itself, about the culture, about the people, the organization. Um, and it's very telling that Jake has had this really long run as sort of the symbol of that company. And Don, in the last three or four years, has stepped up um, to run the company. And she just brings a totally different spin on it. She has a, a real strong focus on building the women's side of the business, on getting a bunch of us old guys to think about what a young women want out of the sport versus what do we want to do. Um, so a lot of people tell you, don't go into business with your family. But if you do, I'd certainly say, pick somebody that you know, you've got some good balance with that you guys can kind of balance your skills, um, and I think that they got, they got a little bit lucky in doing that in the beginning. <clears throat> All right, so that's sort of first two. The second thing that we want to, I want to talk to you guys about is, um, is rider-driven. So it's sort of a, we talk about rider-driven as sort of a slogan, um, because everything we do revolves around snowboarding right now. 
it's really kind of a simple way of saying listen to the customer. Craig Kelly, for anybody that follows snowboarding, is an icon in our sport, um, sort of gone too early. And he taught Jake and Donna and the, the early folks there at the time that they needed to spend a lot more time thinking about what that on-snow experience was. And I know this is going to sound simple and something you think you already would think about if you started a business, but I see it time and time again where people will sit in a meeting and they'll think about something that they think might work versus actually listening to kind of what customers want. And that's something that Craig really taught Burton is that we were in there thinking, I mean, if you ask Jake, he'd say back in the day, he was so, so focused on slalom and on racing, and that's what the US Open was down at Stratton for years. And it took you know, some disruptive people like Craig that said, like, who cares about racing? Like, I just want to go out and have as much fun as possible. So let's start working on the shapes of these boards and, uh, and bright colors and having fun and doing what they're doing and surfing, but let's like, do it on the snow. And that really wouldn't happen unless he, both as a rider and as a customer, kind of came in and said, you guys are kind of missing the point here. Like, this is what kids want to do today. So uh, as you guys think about the businesses you want to be in, I would tell you, like, the customer's not always right, but as soon as you stop listening to them, you can be, can be in a little bit of trouble. Um, and then another thing I'd say, I'd say is that Burton has ebbed and flowed in its successes and losses, I think, but you really have to protect your core customer. When you don't, the whole rest of the business kind of falls apart. So when you start chasing money, you start chasing growth, you start chasing a new region. If you forget about the people that kind of got you there in the very first place, all the rest of it will kind of wash away. And you know, we've had a challenge with it because as you get bigger as a company, you're talking to all these people, you're talking to people all around the world, you're selling jackets to somebody who just wants to go get groceries in it versus a kid that's out there 100 days on snow. And so there's a real kind of balance. Um, and you got to remember when you're, you're having that relationship with a customer that you think you control what your brand is, but the truth is the brand is what they think you are. It's not what you think you are. And so if you slip or you kind of misstep, you're going to see it in the way your customers kind of react to sort of who you are as a brand. Okay, a um, couple other simple things here. So purpose, like when Burton first started, it not only wanted to make great snowboards, but you saw sort of that intensity from Jake. He really was obsessed with the idea of, it was sort of heroic mission of bringing snowboarding to the whole world. That's how he thought. He thought, you know what, this is something that everybody's gonna wanna know about and do once they get into it. To the point where he and his wife moved to Europe for many, many years so they could work with a ski factory to replace that aircraft alloy stuff you saw on the side there and actually put some real edges on it and, and get caught up with the technology that's already happening in skiing for many, many years. And as you guys look at companies down the road, even if you're just gonna apply for a job someplace else, I'd say be mindful of like, is there a really crystal clear purpose for what that company wants to do? Are they just looking to make money and sell more stuff? Or can they tell you what their mission is as a company without talking about dollars and growth? That's something that for many, many years I think was really, really true at Burton. If you walk into our front hall, there's a little quote above all the old snowboards. It says, um, you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. And every time I walk through there in the morning, I always think about all these years. I mean, Jake didn't know what a snowboard in 2015 was going to look like, and that's what we're building right now. But he just knew every snow year he made a snowboard, he could picture new ideas for what was going to make it better and better. And he knew that if he could get people to have the joy he had on a snowboard, he would be in business. And he kind of did everything to sort of make it happen. So. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, I'll ask you about a little bit at the end because I got some questions for you guys is, you think about it, we don't really have to, snowboarding kind of out there, it's happened, it's successful. We're sure, we can fight with ski companies to, you know, for market share and all that kind of stuff, but we don't have to tell the world what snowboarding is. I think they get it, the Olympics is on, it's a very common thing. So Burton's, I think, in some ways, trying to figure out its second act. We, we've, we, maybe we can get more people in Russia and China and South America to snowboard, but we sort of need to figure out our next purpose. So I'll have a couple questions for you guys kind of at the end there. And then another thing real simple, a little bit more on sort of the marketing side of things, but is really about differentiation. You know, Burton was by definition very differentiated from traditional ski back in the day. But I see lots of brands out there, um, and I'll use backpacks as an example. I see a couple Herschel bags that are in here, um, see a Carhartt bags, a couple successful brands right now that are selling that very kind of heritage look. Simple, classic styling. It's not even heritage to you guys because you weren't born when this stuff was happening. But um, now we see this inundation of brands and there's tons of companies that are trying to make that exact same bag. And yeah, maybe they'll steal a little bit of business from a brand like Herschel or a brand like Carhartt, but they're not well differentiated enough that they can be something on their own. Herschel did a great job of coming in and saying, this is who we are. We're gonna tell one story, one vibe. 
and people get it and now in their minds they think of Herschel assigned to those kinds of products. And um, it's one of the things, to be honest, we struggle with. I mean, it's one of the things I wanted to show you guys is, is sort of like, are we differentiated? This is our Spring 14, an ad from our Spring 14 campaign. Um, Jason was just saying to me when he came up that he just got a catalog and saw that we're making some you know, spring summer products. Honestly, we've been doing this for years as part of the, um, the division that I launched, but it's a challenge for us. I, I, to be brutally honest, I, the question I have for you guys is, if I came over here and I covered that logo up, is this a Burton ad? What other brands would you put to it? Yeah. What else? Anything else? What's that? Vans. Vans, Urban Outfitters, PacSun. Not bad company to be in overall, but the truth is we're not very well differentiated here. And it's interesting, if, I'll, I'll show you one more thing, just a quick video. This was a photo shoot we did down in Puerto Rico for this, um, this new collection we're trying to launch. And you can see us kind of struggling to figure out when we can't use the word snowboarding, how can we describe Burton? Check it out. So it's really interesting, the campaign is called Different Season, Same Spirit. So we're, we're trying to find a way to connect you with, if you snowboard or if you're, you aspire to the sport at all, sort of the fun, the independence you get from it. Okay, here you are on a bike, you're on vacation with your friends, you're out swimming, but it's really tricky because when you can't, take, when you can't use snowboarding to describe it, which by definition you can't in the spring and the summer, it's hard to talk about Burton. So it's something, just to be honest, that we're kind of struggling trying to figure out what that means. But differentiation is a super, super important thing because if you don't stand for something in people's minds, that means that they think there's lots of other brands that can buy the exact same thing from you. And actually, I want to show you one quick product example. Um, years ago, when we first started year round, it actually started kind of as a test. So you guys know we have a, we have a store in, uh, in Burlington. Um, we've got a bunch of shops around the world. There's, there's one in LA, there's one in New York, there's one in Chicago, there's one in Tokyo, um, there's one in Austria, and there's a couple of our outlets. So um, we did this rain jacket, not this rain jacket, we did a rain jacket, which years ago sounded totally controversial, like why would somebody buy a rain jacket from Burton? How many people here actually own a rain jacket? How many people actually wear it when it's raining most of the time? All right, mixed bag, right? So you guys are target customers for us. So our first challenge was, again, back to the demographic slide is, it was a balance, like people actually wanted to buy rain jackets from us because they were sick of a North Face jacket or Columbia, they, they wanted something more interesting and, they didn't want their dads kind of slicker. But our core audience, not all of them even bother with rain jackets. Like when I was in high school, the concept of owning a rain jacket was the dumbest thing I would have thought of. I just got wet, I guess. I wasn't smart enough to think about it. But so anyways, we, we launched rain jackets because we just did it in our own stores. Like, oh, let's just try it and see what people think. And we sold some and then some didn't really move off the shelves. And we sort of learned like, oh, if we're going to make rain jackets, they need to be differentiated. So this technically is almost spot on to what you might buy from a North Face or a Columbia, but obviously in a colorway that you're probably not going to find from them. We did this like sublimated kind of knit print that it's got this visual interest, makes you want to like walk up and touch it and see if it's a sweater or whatever. And then the sort of unexpected, you know, contrast pop here. And then oftentimes we'll do something kind of interesting in color. So a good example of differentiation. This is the same rain jacket you can buy from anybody else. We're just using graphics and color to try to make it kind of interesting and different. It's doing okay, by the way. Rain jackets. I'm not, I'm not going to retire in the rain jacket business probably, but we're making, making some progress. Okay, so another kind of simple concept, very boring term, but it's super, super important is this concept of core competencies. I talked to you guys about purpose, like what is your mission? What do you feel like it's your job to kind of bring to the world that's not just about making money? That's a little different than core competencies. And at Burton, we have a really simple formula, this kind of trigent concept. Function, design, and performance. When we make stuff, we want to be kind of firing on all three of those cylinders. If, when I think about the best products we have, and I'll show you a couple examples, they, do, they have this balance of all three of them. You take a company like Black Diamond. Black Diamond makes extremely functional climbing gear. Is it beautiful? Yes, but pretty outdoor. They don't spend a lot of time on sort of visual aesthetics, interesting colors. 
you look at a brand um, like Vans, I'll take for example, in apparel, they make beautifully, they're making some nicely designed products or whatever. Do you guys, would you picture buying a rain jacket from Vans? Maybe a little bit less than you would from an outdoor brand, right? Because frankly, they haven't really been as focused on function as they have on design. And then performance, the third one, is it sounds a little bit similar to function, but at Burton, it's really about sort of on snow performance. It's that experience you can get when you're riding. Like we can make something that the bindings on your snowboard are really functional and they're easy to get into and the graphic, you're so psyched on, it just seems perfect. And then when you actually drop in, like it's not that rad. So we make products where we try to kind of get all three of those things firing at kind of the same time. So um, I just want to show you a couple simple examples. Um, start with a little one. So this is a binding strap. Um, how many people here snowboard or own a snowboard? All right, so a bunch of you guys are familiar with the gear. So this is a binding strap that's on our Genesis binding and a couple other new bindings. I'm not out here selling, by the way. I don't expect you to go out and buy it. Um, my bindings that I have, yeah, yeah. I don't make any money off of bindings. But buy the rain jackets, don't buy this stuff. Uh, just kidding. So we make, you know, we made bindings for years. My bindings at home in my garage, they have, you know, this kind of cut and sew little strap on it. And um, some of our engineers were like, hey, what if we just did a fully injected strap? It's basically this, this black part is just kind of squirted out of a machine. And it allows you to get rid of all the cut and sew, the glue, all that other stuff. So it's much simpler to make. But it also allows us to basically make it at exactly the shape we want so that it doesn't break down over time because the foam doesn't get old on the inside. And that's funny because I remember Jake and some of the other guys were like first looking at it and they're like, it's just super nerdy and looks really tech. I, I don't, it doesn't look comfortable to me. It just looks like stiff or whatever. But when you put this binding on and you feel it, it actually performs way better than, um, than what we do in kind of our traditional binding. What's up? Sick. So there you go. A testament. <laughs> I'll pay a few bucks after for that. Um, so an example here, we're like, we were really trying to work on the function and performance side of it, but we're still trying to figure out the design because it's a little spaceshipy, right? So, you know, they, they pop some color here and they're trying to work through ways that this thing doesn't maybe alienate some customers that are used to looking at this beautiful kind of cut and sew product. So that sits somewhere in the kind of the spectrum. And obviously another big one here, split boarding. How many people know about split boarding? So, a little bit more sort of core enthusiast, but um, this is something that's been around, Jason can attribute, it's been around for a long time. Again, not something Burton sort of uh, invented, but we've, because there's more and more kids that are riding in the backcountry, we're spending more and more time trying to figure out how we can make the experience of splitboarding more fun. Used to be, um, you know, you'd take an old snowboard, you'd cut it in half, and then you'd find a way to basically make these two things skis to skin up the hill. You get to the top, you piece it together with this hardware, you shove your bindings back on, and you get the snowboarding experience going down. Pretty cumbersome, and it's taken a lot of companies, um, including Burton, a long time to try to get to here. In fact, these are not Burton bindings for anybody that pays attention. I think these are Sparks. Um, and so it's something that we're just getting back into a little bit more, um, but it's something that you wouldn't have seen, I think, from us years ago because we were so focused on freestyle snowboarding, and then whenever we approached the splitboarding market, we were like, well, I don't know how much more we can innovate on this thing, and the boards look kind of hokey. So we're trying to look at it through these three lenses right now to figure out sort of, okay, cool, how do we make some interesting graphics and colors? Can we play around with different shapes so we can make a powder board that's a split board, you can make a small jib board that's a split board. Um, anybody wants to check this out after, happy to show you the deal. So anyways, Knowing your core competencies, and this isn't just about a company, I think it's about you guys too, can really be helpful. If I asked you to put three things in here that you know you're really good at, and that would make you want to go to work every day and be psyched to do whatever it is you're doing, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Sure. Yeah. How does Burton um, maintain or build those competencies within the company and, and all the different pieces of the company? How do you organize to bring those competencies to bear on a particular product or category? Well, it's funny, so our, our VP of Hard Goods often talks about, this is called the trigent in the boring business speak world, and he often talks about the tension between the three of them, is that oftentimes if you get a product that does all three of them well, they, they all kind of fight each other, because if the, the more you make something totally performance oriented, the harder it is to make it really beautiful and make space for graphics and all that, because of materials you have to use, you start to narrow yourself down. So we have people, we have, parts of our company that are responsible for each one. So on the function side of things, we have a huge network of testers. There's guys that 
I sit at work, it'll be about 10 a.m. and I'll hear that sound of snow pants like going past my office and it'll be some guy, one of our testers that gets to every day take something new on the hill. And he'll, he'll walk past me with stuff that looks like, it doesn't even look like a snowboard. I'm like, what, are you tr what is that thing? What are you guys making? He's like, oh, we're just testing something. So we have a whole group of people that don't think about the design. They're just thinking about the function and the performance. And then you have people that are spending all of their time just thinking about, for lack of a better term, the design, the visual, what we call the visual communication of the product, the graphics, the ID, the color. And they're fighting every day to make sure that that product looks as sick as it possibly can. And it's, then you come together somewhere in the middle of the season where you, you have some trade-offs. You say, okay, this really matters to me. Okay, well, I want, I can tell you that if we, what you do over here graphically is gonna sacrifice the performance of the board. And it's just this ongoing conversation. And that debate is actually one of the things that makes Burton great is because it might look a little bit easy from the outside, but we're just constantly fighting because you're, you're trying to make the best products for customers. But to do all three, three of those things well, it's a little bit disruptive and you get, there's trade-offs. You know, you can't, it's tough to get all three of those things done perfectly. Um, and when we do, you know it because something will hit the market and it gets a lot of attention because it's got this really nice balance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just wondering who, who does Jake still sort of approve all final products and he's sort of the master who's sort of assessing that that balance is in, in I, balance? Or I would call Jake the, um, nowadays I'd call Jake well, Jake brings a lot of amazing ideas because Jake still to this day probably snowboards more than anybody I know and he loves snowboarding more than anybody I know and he hikes more than anybody I know. So he'll come in, we're not just with the, well, the old man comes in with a crazy idea again. He'll come in with like an idea that will change the game for us. And so, and this is hard good, like in hard goods, which is not my world, he'll come in and say, you know, this happened the other day, like, I don't get why you need two hands to strap in. It's like, it's just so dumb. And we're like, are you kidding me? Like these bindings, like they're the easiest, you used to, you had milk jugs for bindings and these are the easiest things in the world to use now. They're so advanced. There's, you know, I feel like our bindings are among the best in the industry. We got people that love them, that we come up with new technology every year. And, and then he comes and he gives you a simple comment like, why can't I just get off and just lean over and just one flick of the wrist and I'm in. And so then the bindings guys will be like, all right, and I'll go back to their desk and try to figure it out. And we have a meeting every year, it's called Jake's Ride Around Table and all of our team, all of our <laughs> professional athletes and senior management get together and we show the entire line together and we call it the Shark Tank because you're basically coming in and you're like trying to pitch your idea for this new innovation and everyone's kind of not beating up about it but they're just really trying to progress the sport and progress the products. So it's not, it's not an him with final say but he's certainly sort of the provocateur. He's the guy that wants to push you to do things that you're not quite sure how to pull off. Any other questions on that? Okay, cool. So um, really just sort of last thing is about innovation. Um, it's obviously important and it's kind of at the core of what we do. Um, and I just want to show you a really quick video that shows you a little bit of inside Burton. <coughs> um, and then we'll talk about it after. You know, Craig was a guy that I'd always had a good relationship with, even before he wrote for us. And I remember him coming to visit, and we just built our first sort of higher end factory where we were making boards with molded boards with steel edges and all that. And it was a pretty, it was kind of like this. It was very similar in size and sort of what we we're up to, to what's going in this facility right now. It's what made, really made Craig convinced that he wanted to ride for us and partner up and get involved. And, and working with us, you know, Craig was an engineer at heart, and uh, it was it was what made it happen, what made our relationship tick once he got involved with Burton. He was so into pushing board design, and he brought us so far. It seemed only appropriate we would name this place after him. I mean, I owe so much to that guy, but teaching me how to listen to riders, and that you know, he did himself pushing our board design. So it's, there's nobody else, there's no other man to be on the board than his. Well, when I started the company, it was uh, it was a long process learning how to, to make a board because I was like loser in shop class kid. And I had to make boards myself by hand, and it took a long time to figure it out. But I kind of fell in love with manufacturing, and it's something that we've always had right wherever we are, wherever my office is. We've always had a factory making snowboards nearby, and this is pretty much the ultimate 
prototyping facility, I think, for our sport, our industry, in the world. We decided to focus purely on prototyping and just developing product. Well, you know, what happens here is we get ideas from riders, we get ideas from engineers who work for the company, we get feedback from, from the market, from people out there riding, from dealers. We can respond to that really quickly here and make sure that our product design is heading in the right direction. We get a lot of engineers that work here and a lot of um, very smart people that are really creative, but at the same time they're capable of talking to team riders and, and feeling them out and finding out what they're looking for and what they want. It just makes for a lot of innovative R&D projects. And then we need a facility like this with like rapid prototyping machinery that can make a plastic part, let's say for a binding, like right away, overnight put in a computer program, flip a switch, and come back the next morning and it's there. And it's even rideable stuff that we can make here. In terms of snowboards, that's something we've always done. And we're cranking those out, you know, we can make a board in a day with a new stack or whatever somebody wants. I, mean, I think a lot of what we're trying to do these days is open up our company to providers and letting them see what's going on. And this place is no exception. We like to, you know, we've got a warranty window right up front. People can walk right up there. And, we want to set it up so that there are a lot more tours in this facility and people can come and see how boards are made and see what we're about. Yeah, our heritage is, is snowboarding. It's what we're about. It's, it's all the brand's about. I mean, Burton's not about anything else. And this place is a very good example of that. So if you're wondering about the soul of this company, come check this place out. Again, consummate salesman. So um, I just want to show you guys a little bit of the inside. Some, maybe some of you guys have been there. You can go on your tour and check it out. It really is um, innovation in general is such an important part of Burton. It's part of what's gotten the sport to where it is because Jake and the culture he's built is kind of constantly asking questions. And he showed us growing some bindings there. And it is really amazing that the guy that's walking past me in his snow pants in the morning, oftentimes he'll be on a, a, what we call a rapid prototype, a, a binding part that they grew the day before next day or uh, next door and they'll take it on snow he'll make some notes they'll come back and then they'll, they'll adjust the parts and so in our world you know we're working on building new luggage luggage is something that um, is a successful business for us a lot of people uh, we get a lot of sort of positive comments about our, our luggage and again that sort of combination of design you know sort of this old school kind of drug rug looking thing color wise skate wheels which is kind of a nod to skateboarding but are also super functional and then this real bomber back um, that honestly like we almost never get these in warranty because you can just we could fill this thing with lead lead balls and go up to the roof and chuck it off and it won't break it's it's kind of insane so but it's also sort of dated and this is what happens when you're a burden you know I'm sitting there year after year patting myself in the back for this great luggage we built and somebody comes in and they're like why are all these rivets on the back and why is this thing so heavy and you're like okay I guess back to the drawing board and so this isn't, uh, we're, we're just getting there and there's not a lot I can show you guys yet, but these are just a couple RP parts of handles, some new ideas we're, we're playing around with in terms of shapes. How can we get some weight out of this thing but keep all of the strength in the product? And that's all stuff that we do next door and it's all things that are, I will say they are not, um, I call them mandatory as part of the job. Like if you, if you want to be at Burton and be successful, innovation is a really important part of what you do. Certainly a big advantage that Burton's invested in all this equipment that maybe some other, other brands didn't over the years and that gave them a big advantage to make those Genesis bindings. Um, but I'd also say like it doesn't take this, it just takes you guys thinking about things differently. I mean even the idea I know about for Jason for the ski company, it's like that's innovation but it's not just about how it gets made, it's about how it gets to a customer, how we think about the market. And I'm telling you, you guys are so much better equipped than your, the older generation to think about how you want the world to work. You guys were born with overnight shipping. I thought email was a fad, okay? so. I would encourage you to, you know, look at the world through your lens and ask yourself, like, what if, what if people overlooked out there that it's an obvious next step, but no one's taking the time to kind of go and figure it out sort of for themselves. Um, one other one I wanted to show you real quick is just, is uh, a great, another great example of how those three things kind of interact together. So this is the M-Series goggle. I don't know if you guys have seen from Anon, which is a brand that Burton owns, very much like a part of our company. Just happens to have a different name. So I grew up in a time when it was really cool, you have more than one, you know, skiing as a little kid down in Killington, you have a couple different lenses depending on the weather, and it was, that was like innovation, right? It was sunny out, you get a dark lens, if it got late in the day, you could put a clear lens on, it was amazing. 
I never really thought about the fact that it is a complete pain in the ass to change the lenses, which is why I basically would just run the same lenses. I'd, to this day, actually, because I don't, I don't repair these yet, I have probably five different lenses in my bag in my truck right now, and I bet you, you I've used the exact same lens every single day. Day, we go, we got, do a lot of splitboarding at night. I never, ever change them because it's just too much of a pain in the ass. So the goggle guys said, okay, we, we're, we found ways to make this product beautiful. We think it performs really well. Like, how can we make this thing more functional? And I don't know exactly where, but somehow somebody came up with this idea of just using magnets. And so it's such a simple concept. And obviously, it probably took them some time to develop. But all these little parts that anybody here it's old school, you spent your whole time trying to like get them in there, and they take forever. And by then, like you're over it. Is that now they just found a way to just snap them on. And I can tell you, like they truly work. Everybody asks if they're going to fall off or if they get foggy or whatever. They've spent a lot of time kind of tooling it. And as soon as I saw them, I'm like, that's just genius. So when you hear Jake say, why can't I strap in with just one hand? Or I look at a backpack and say, why do I have to clip the buckles every time I want to put my board carrier on whatever? Like, maybe it's magnets. But that kind of innovation and thinking across categories is part of what I think has sort of made it successful. And it's the stuff that, honestly, we can't get lazy on. Because as soon as you do, a younger company or somebody like you guys is going to come out and you're going to kind of do your own thing. So. Um, I think it's kind of at the heart. I finished there just because I think it's sort of the heart of what we do. Um, and I also think it's the thing that probably for you guys is your biggest advantage because the older you get, the more you picture the world the way your whole life went, not the way it's going to be in the future. So that's it. Any questions? I think that's it. Oh, yeah. Thanks. One, one last, I'll give you one last cautionary tale. I had to have one graph, you know, as a business guy. So this is our bag business over 10 years. And um, this would be good. This is for you guys, all right? So this is our bag business over 10 years. These are collection names that we've had. This, back in 05, 06, we launched this new um, simple pack collection. It's a skate pack collection. We called it District. And everybody said it wouldn't work. It wouldn't sell. We're not a skateboard brand, blah, 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 whatever. And they were right for a little while. If I follow this graph down, it goes right to zero. We got a little bit of traction, and then kind of things went, and things started to work. And the next thing you know, we'd sold you know, a few million pieces. It's a lot of bags. But as quickly as we had gotten to the peak, the end started to happen. Herschel comes into the business. You guys don't want to want to, I mean, I bet you if I counted all the backpacks in here, there'd be less, certainly less than 50% of these bags would be skate packs. Five, six years ago, there'd be a lot more of them. And so this business just died. And fortunately, we had started to work on some new collections, but we hadn't really started this heritage collection, which is a little closer to what you get from Herschel, until here. We basically reacted, and we reacted too late. And it's another important reason why innovation matters. Is it's not just about like prototyping. It's about understanding in the market, like when is something over? Should we be making rainwear at all? Who the heck needs skate straps if you're not walking around with a skateboard at all? You know. And so, again, I'd encourage you guys to sort of think about the world in this way of like, what's been going on for a really long time that just sort of seems dated? And we've, we've had some successes. This was, this was foresight on our part. And this is foresight here. And this is reaction. So nobody's ever right all the time, but you live and learn. All right, that's it. <clears throat> Can ask me anything. Now's your chance. Uh, do you think so you talked a little bit about like trends and yeah. you know, especially with that last example, like the trend kind of died. Um, do you think that's something like all businesses deal with to a big extent? And do you think it's part of kind of the business in the market you're in? Do you think it's a little harder for something like you know selling snowboards to young kids? Like it's gonna be a little more up and down. Maybe? Yeah. I'd say the answer is yes and yes. Yes, the business we're in trends have to move faster. The fastest moving trend business I know of is really fashion. Like if you're just selling apparel and you want to sell as just an, a fashion brand with not a lot of function to the product, you got to be on it. And there are not a lot of brands in this world, except for maybe something like a Ralph Lauren that have actually like stayed in that game that long. It's just really hard to do. But I, I, so I do think it's, we see more of it, but I will say that the world is moving faster. Technology, access to information is moving quicker. So trends, and not just style trends, but just trends and change, I think is, is moving quicker than uh, it has 100 years ago, for sure. Yeah. Um, back to like the whole style thing and like spring and summer line. Yeah. 
what, like, because you dropped the program brands, and, like, those are more, or, like, Gravis is more, like, a lifestyle brand. Yep. Type deal. Why do you think that, like, the spring and summer aren't going to work? Well, I think you're asking two questions, really. Like, first of all, why do we drop the program brands and the Gravis brands? Um, <clears throat> so Gravis still exists. We only sell it in Japan. And um, those brands were more year-round oriented, but we had a hard time getting the traction, I think, that we get more easily with Burton. There are a lot of people out there that were huge fans of the brand, but as we tried to kind of grow that fan base and offer products that were well differentiated, we struggled. And you can't say it was, I think it was a super tough decision for, for Burton, um, but it, they did that with a renewed fo focus on trying to get Burton, sort of the big brand that had been working really well, um, totally stabilized before it thought about brands like Analog, which still does exist. We just focus a little bit more on winter products right now. Um, I can tell you that I believe that the Burton year-round brand can be successful because I do think that there's something that we do well that's not just about snowboarding. It's for sure snowboarding is at the heart of it, but Patagonia started as a climbing brand, but most of you guys probably don't buy climbing gear from Patagonia. And North Face started as a mountaineering brand, and you buy probably anything but mountaineering gear from them. But it's, you know, the genesis of those amazing brands was sort of the inspiration for what makes great products. And I think at Burton, we, we like to make things where we blend function and style together. I, I joke all the time, it's like, I think you could go to our design guys and say, I want you to make the coolest freaking looking coffee machine possible, and they would come up with something that you wouldn't expect. Do I think we should make coffee machines? No. But I do think that we can make products, um, and I'll ask you guys actually, that are not expected from a snowboarding brand, but they're not all the way over into just making board shorts. So um, how many people here would buy a tent from Burton? Right? Kind of a strange thing to wonder about. How about snowshoes? How about skis? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not making skis, I promise. Um, <coughs> So yeah, there's, there's a sort of spectrum of like, what's, what feels like a, a product that the brand has permission to sell to me? And that's, some of that is about us coming up with cool ideas. And then for you marketers in the room, some of that has to do with us evolving the relationship we have with our customers. We've done one thing really, really well for 30 years. We make great snowboards. How do we evolve that relationship to be like, hey, we want you to have fun, maybe not in the heat of summer, but maybe in the spring, like rainwear, or maybe it's camping, like a tent, but it's just car camping or going to Coachella or doing something fun like that. Would you ever, or have you ever considered um, looking at these other products and saying, okay, uh, maybe we're not gonna get a good reaction to buying a Burton tent, but if we buy a tent brand sure. that's reasonable and apply Burton's philosophy and branding approach yep. um, to that brand, could that work? Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, back to the program brands. Those are all snowboard brands for the most part, or action sports brands. We have yet to do that where we would acquire a brand that's got nothing to do with our sport and see if we can put some life into it or there's a synergy there. So I think that's one version of it. Another version of it is collaborations. It's finding categories that you, um, you know, we made a whole Carhartt collection. Uh, Carhartt's a very big brand in Europe, has a really different look and feel than the workwear brand here. And, we made some really cool products there that were just a little, there were still jackets, which we make a lot of, but there were jackets, there were products that you wouldn't get from Burton. And I think that um, that's one avenue to doing it. And we're trying to learn the levels on both. What can we do from Burton that doesn't feel like we're just out there trying to make more money, that we actually create a benefit for the customer? And what's just somebody else's business and they do it well and we should let them do it well? Any other questions? Yeah. When do you know when to pull a plug on a product? When you said the back tags are going to go? Where do you say, I'm not going to innovate it, see if you can go back up? When do you know to just drop it? Good question. The trick, one of the tricks of our business is that when you guys go to a store to buy that product, we made it six months earlier because of the production lead times and the transportation to get that product sent out to all over the world. And then we use sales reps to sell it. So six, six months before that, they got theirs. So right now, we're going to deliver, um, we just finished selling next winter's product. So you're basically always a year in advance. So it gets really tricky to know. You're basically a year and a half before a trend is about to die, you kind of have to have an inkling of it because that's when you have to start planning your line and designing and developing the collection. Um, that's the long answer. The short answer is you, you follow the numbers too. When you look and you're like, yeah, you know what? This, if we were paying attention to this line, we say, you know, it's flattening out. And we knew that. We just didn't totally understand what should be coming next, I think, or fast enough. 
So you got if you really pay attention to the, the, I haven't talked about the numbers a lot, but you gotta really be mindful of sort of what is selling season by season and, and not just the big top line number, but go to those markets, like go to Southern California where we have a lot of important customers and they're sort of an exporter of cool in a lot of ways. Go see what those guys are doing. And if those core shops out there are kind of softening up on certain products, maybe you should be paying attention for the rest of the world. You had a question? Okay. Oh, good question. So the logo is called the process logo. And everything uh, Bob had asked is sort of, how do we put those three core competencies together? And uh, it was made many years ago um, by this firm in town, JDK Design. Had a close relationship with Burton, did a lot of board graphics for us. And there really is this process of Burton to making products. You come up with ideas. Actually, I think I have a little, just a little graphic that shows it. <clears throat> you come up with ideas. You sketch them, you draw them, you think about the segments in the, around the world where you'd actually want to sell them. You keep refining those ideas, you pick some materials and trims, you go build those prototypes, and then you test the heck out of it. You finalize, and actually, truthfully, you do this, and then you repeat it again, and that's really where the logo comes from, is this constant sense of like, you start the process here, keep doing it again. Secondary influence of it is obviously like, when you, anybody that snowboards here goes to the mountain, you take a run, you hop on the lift, you go back to the top, you take a run, you keep repeating. And that sort of cyclical nature of what we do, also that kind of we're, we're a seasonal brand, was a bit of the inspiration around it. And then if you look at it, it makes a nice little B. Yeah? Um, I guess this kind of doesn't really have to do with like, like the product aspect. I'll product, make something up. But, okay. um, I guess like, so obviously <clears throat> like you got hired at Burton. Mm -hmm. Like if you say you were someone that like was interested in maybe having a job there, like what yeah. kind of people or like like what should you go into like that interview with or like, like what kind of people like would you say they hire more often? Cool. I'm glad you asked it. I think first of all, you don't need to snowboard. There's a lot of there's a misconception out there that like you have to be way into snowboarding to work at Burton. Truthfully, you go back and talk to some ladies that work in accounting, like they could care less about snowboarding, right? Um, so it, if you want to work in product development, it certainly helps because you're going to be sitting thinking about snowboarding. If you want to work in luggage, you want to know about travel. So having that field of expertise is first and foremost super important. And I think from there, um, Burden looks, it's going to sound sort of cliche, but like Burden looks for people that have tons of drive. You know, when I, when they stuck me on a plane my first day on the job to Asia, it wasn't to kind of go over there and sort of mentor me and show me where everything was. They basically just like kick you out of the nest and say, go get it done, don't come back until you got it figured out. And so there's, there's this very sense of um, self-reliance that comes from way back in the day with Jake and Donna. They don't really, it's not a lot of like babysitting going on. So you need to be really self-reliant. You need to want to take initiative on stuff. I think you have to be um, really creative, not meaning you have to, you know, draw creative, but you have to be a creative problem solver. You'll be able to think about stuff in a different way. So you come to work and you can't figure something out. You got to go home, come back with a totally different sort of perspective. Um, yeah, I'd say that I'd say that that's kind of it. And the one other piece of advice I'd give, because people ask me all the time about different, like getting different kinds of jobs at Burton, and this would maybe general advice to you guys is that when you when somebody wants to hire another person, there's a job posting, and you go in there, they're really just looking for somebody to solve their problems. They're looking for somebody that can just like they have to get this thing done, even if it's innovation. They just want somebody that can go and do it, and they can be like, check that that part's happening. And the, the biggest challenge we all face, and I faced it at Burton too, was when you don't have the experience to go in there and then convince them that you can do the job. It's the chicken and the egg, right? Like, how do I get a job working in product when I can't get anybody that works in product unless you're these two smart guys and you start your own brand, which takes a lot of guts and takes time and money and whatever. And so I would encourage you, like, if you know what you want to do, find every way you can to do the job before you get the job. If you want to work in product development, go work at an outdoor shop or volunteer to help some guys that are starting a brand. Like, do it for free, find somebody that'll teach you, get it onto a resume so that you walk in there and you can just sort of scrape together a little bit of experience, which is what I did. I said, hey, I love snowboarding, I've taught snowboarding, I've done all this marketing around brands like this, I've worked with lots of different kinds of product brands, and they still said no, and then I got a little bit lucky. Anything else? Yeah. Um, what first made you guys go into a summer brand for like the off season stuff, and like, what made you think that people were actually going to buy off-season stuff from Burton? So, like, Good question. Well, 
the, I'll give you a two answers probably. The business answer is a hard thing about a brand, Jason can attest to this, a hard thing about a really season specific brand is that you make all of your money in a really narrow window. If you own a restaurant, it'd be the equivalent of you saying we're open the first Saturday of every month, no other days. I hope people show up. Really, it's what it's like. And so it's risky. If it doesn't snow, you're kind of screwed. And so you got to find ways, either through other brands or through other categories, to just sort of diversify a little bit. And if you look at that cycle of 12 months, to not make all your money in this one really narrow chunk. And it's the problem all sporting goods brands have, unless you're like a North Face that can kind of sell year round. If you went to an LL Bean, they'll tell you people hunting fish in three months and then it's kind of over or whatever. So that was the business reason behind it. The product reason behind it was, I think at the peak of um, the snowboarding trend, so many people come to us and say, I love everything you guys make, I wish you made more. And I think, to be totally frank, um, I've been there for about 10 years, I think Burton underestimated initially what it would take to find something that was actually meaningfully differentiated from all the other crap that you can buy from all these other brands that don't make snowboard stuff, right? And we, we've backpedaled in places to say, okay, you know what, like, maybe we're gonna buy, we'll, we'll make some denim, but we're gonna make it for people who really love Burton because we know the rest of the world doesn't need denim. And we're gonna make rain jackets or technical fleece or things for people that would use it in like spring riding or things that are still connected to the brand. And I think we sort of broke that promise for a little bit and we were trying to figure out who we were. And we've, we're starting to reel it back in a little bit, but you saw from the videos that we're still kind of finding our way. And it's a, it's a, it's a conversation with the customers, they tell you. If they don't, they don't like what you're serving at the restaurant, they'll tell you pretty quick, so. Anything else, guys? Sorry. Hey, oh, sorry. Oh, What's up? Little, like, just little trigger and just like the function design performance. Yeah. How often does price kind of trump any one of those? Like, you know what I mean? Like, this would be a sick product and it would fill all three of those, but it's going to be way too expensive and the customer would be buying it. Sure. Well, it helps if you, if you're known from your customers as being a premium brand, it means you can charge more. Not meaning charge more for something cheap, but you can have a higher price point. You know, Burton's famously put up $1,000 snowboards or whatever, and we, of course we don't sell nearly as many of them as you do as the prices that most of us would buy at. But um, that helps if you're a brand that has the permission to sell up there. We don't ever, um, if, we, if we cover those three grounds, we make something you think is really innovative, and then all of a sudden we look and we say it's too expensive, most times we try to figure out a way how to work with it. Either you're gonna profit a little less on it because you just think customers are gonna be so psyched. And any new product you have, by definition, you're not selling a lot of them. So it's harder to make money profit-wise on that stuff. The more you can make, the easier it gets to kind of economies of scale, you can profit a little bit more. But we don't let price be a reason that we wouldn't put something in the market. It, but we'd maybe find a way to either position it high in price, take a little bit less on it and really monitor it for a year, but if we came up with that goggle and we were like, ah, you know what, it's too expensive, forget it, we wouldn't walk away. In fact, they started selling those goggles at 150, 200 bucks when most of the market was buying a goggle. The last pair I bought was probably 75 bucks. And honestly, it's, we can't make them fast enough right now. So if you make something that's got all three of, the, three of those things really wired in, or all three of the things that matter to your brand, I think oftentimes you can command a higher price. Cool, thanks guys, appreciate it.